With an IQ close to that of Einstein's, my guest tonight has advanced where no Indian has gone before. To chess lovers of the world, he is a demigod. I am thrilled to have a rendezvous with the Shatranj Kakilari, Super Grandmaster Vishwanathan Anand, and the queen who checkmated him, his wife Aruna. Rishi, it's great to have you here. And you've come all the way from Spain for this rendezvous. I thank you. Thank you. It's nice to be here. We're both in white, so who's going to make the first move? Ladies first. E4. C5. Knight C3. Hmm. I resign. <laughs> I don't <laughs> believe it. It's too strong. <laughs> this is the greatest day of my life. What have you been learning? I, um, I've been playing a lot on my computer, and I've been following your games. <laughs> okay. But tell me, when did you first make a move on the chessboard? I was about six, and uh, my brother and sister were playing chess. Mm. So um, I asked my mother if she could teach me how to play, and uh, that's pretty much how it all started. And then by the time you were eight, you were playing in tournaments? Yes. Um, there was a chess club called the Michael Tal Chess Club, and uh, this was very active in Madras. And um, pretty soon I played my first tournament. How did you become so good at it, Vishy? I enjoyed uh, studying it a lot. Your father was saying that you were so obsessed with chess that they would dread the chess magazine arriving at home during lunch, because that would mean they wouldn't see you for lunch. You probably wouldn't have food that day. Yes, this is still true. Uh, still, when I get a magazine, I have to finish it before anything else. Like if I start reading it, then I hate uh, having to eat or doing, you know, do anything else till I finish the magazine. And you were in the Philippines for some time. Your father was posted there? Yeah. And they still chess contests or quizzes on television, correct? Yes. Uh, eventually, I got pretty good at those puzzles. But apparently, you got so good that uh, you won all the prizes. And then they said, look, this guy, Vishwanathan Anand, cannot compete because he's taken away all the prizes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the prize for every correct solution was a chess book. At some point, they took me to the library and said, take all the books you want and please don't come back. <laughs> don't come back. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yeah. But I want to know, were you good at everything? Were you good at maths and geography? Or was it more chess? Um, I was a reasonable student. Uh, I mean, I wasn't getting close to 100 or anything like that. But uh, it really started to affect me when I was in the 10th standard or thereabouts. Mm. But uh, that was because I was already an international master and uh, playing really a lot of chess. And now, 20 years later, chess critics, the press, the Washington Post, everybody's acclaimed that you're the best player in the world. I feel like it's come quite naturally. You know, I, I feel that uh, I've really grown as a chess player in the last seven, eight years. I mean, I was a very strong grandmaster seven years ago. And now I really feel that I'm playing great chess. But if you weren't a chess grandmaster, what do you think you would have been? Mm. I don't know. It's difficult to imagine. Uh, I guess if I wasn't a chess master, I would try to become a chess master. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk to you about the Knockout World Championship earlier this year. Mm -hmm. It's a fact that the seeding was unfair and undemocratic. Sure. Karpov was seeded straight into the finals. Yes. And the rest of us had to start in round two. But it really was like Sampras having to play just one match in Wimbledon to defend his title. Yes, that's exactly right. It would be as if uh, Sampras had been seeded into the final. And uh, also, it's a self perpetuating system. If he's seeded in the final, his chances of winning it against a tired opponent who goes through all the rounds earlier are very high. And if he wins, he gets the right to be seeded again. It's, uh, it's not a very satisfactory system. At the end, we knew one guy was really going to be yeah. really unfairly treated by the system, and that was me. Uh, people like uh, Kasparov and Kramnik, they refused to play because they felt it was unfair. Mm -hmm. Why did you agree to such an unfair system? Well, it was um, already the second year that uh, we'd gone without a world championship. And um, if you also wait too long, 
uh, for a world championship then okay your skills are getting you just spend, you're just waiting mm -hmm. and i felt okay something is better than nothing uh, i hated the situation but um, i felt that somehow i had to play but Karpov is not world champion in the sense that he's, he's there by default, isn't he? Well, he's not even really world champion. Uh, he, he was world champion in 1975 because, uh, though he didn't play a match then, even then he got it by default. Yes. Uh, in fact, he's the first world champion to get uh, the title twice. By default. <laughs> by default. Uh, in 1993, it was clear that uh, he became world champion simply because Kasparov uh, withdrew. Okay. But he was not the winner of the cycle at that point. Uh, and in fact, he should not have uh, been given the, they should have had a fresh cycle because uh, it's not like the world champion left, so the next best thing. He was just um, the most opportune for, and okay, he's um, got good connections in FIDE. So it was a pretty ridiculous situation. So tell me, is there a lot of politics in chess as there is in cricket or more? Mm, I don't know how much there is in cricket, but there's an awful lot in chess. Is there a lot of rivalry? Mm, yes, it's, a lot it's pretty of intense, just like any... Sport, I guess. No, because uh, I remember hearing a story that uh, Napier was asked which was the best game he played. Mm -hmm. And he said, the one I lost to Lasker. Mm -hmm. Now, today there's so much competition because there's so much money. Would, would a player be able to say that today, that the best game he played was the one he lost? There are very few people who do that. Usually it takes a very generous uh, person to say, oh, this was a fantastic game or something. I usually you prefer your own games. I certainly prefer my own games, and uh, no. Uh, besides, I, I, I think uh, it's a little bit unhealthy to start liking uh, your opponent's games, <laughs> unless unless they're really, really artistic, yeah. uh, and very few are. Do you think it's important to inject a, a degree of animosity during the tournament? I don't think it's necessary for me. Hmm. In fact, I find it much easier to play against uh, people who I have no bad feelings towards. But uh, sometimes it's just necessary. I mean, uh, there has come some kind of subtle, um, you know, warfare going on. There and is. Uh, there is. And like uh, how? Some of the scandals that went on in the Karpov Korchnoi match. Mm. Uh, they were quite legend. That match was quite legendary. Karpov uh, decided that he wanted to have some yogurt during the game. And uh, normally, this would be a request. You would just say, "Okay, fine." Yeah. But uh, Kochna said, no, 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 a yogurt could mean a signal. I mean, if he gets blueberry yogurt at uh, 4 o'clock, this could mean something. And if he gets strawberry yogurt at 6, this could mean offer a draw. So I don't agree with this. So I think like two days of negotiations. Over the yogurt? <laughs> Over the yogurt. And finally they said, okay, he can have, a, I think, a blueberry yogurt at uh, 6 p.m. and uh, nothing else during the game. Anything else had to be, any other request had to be submitted well in advance. I don't believe this. <laughs> When I, my first match uh, was a very funny incident. My opponent, Drev, uh, him in a second just decided, uh, well, they didn't like the tablecloth. So I said, ah, you know, this tablecloth uh, glitters under the lights and uh, I'm getting disturbed. So um, they kept changing all the tablecloths for him. He said, we like a red, we like it, this thing, you know, flipping it around. At some point, I got pretty annoyed with this. So I said, no, I don't like this. So why? I, I just don't like it. You have to change <laughs> it as well. So we got stuck. And at some point, I just said, OK, this is ridiculous. I don't want to get into this. We'll just give him whatever tablecloth he wants. And uh, it was quite liberating. But I remember reading about, I think Kapsky was playing, was it with Adams or Short? And he was coughing quite a lot. Yes. Who was uh, it? With, with Short. With Short. And Short said, well, you know, why, why don't you have some water? And then Kapsky's father came and got him by the scruff of his mm -hmm. neck and assaulted him and said, what do you mean by disturbing my son? Yes, Kapsky's father was an extreme case because uh, he alleged that anybody who passed by his son's board uh, was trying to give a signal one way or the other. So Short and Kapsky are playing over there and I was playing with Adams over here. And uh, it was ridiculous. They wanted to put a partition. So it's normal to walk over and look. But he said, no, 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 if, uh, they could be giving him signals just, you know, whether they come in from the right or they come in from the left. And, and, uh, well, he was a bit of an extreme case. But, Paranoid. Um, yeah. The point is, once you've got into this mentality that um, you're occupying a finite space and uh, any territory you give him, is it's a, you're losing. Losing. Once you get into that mentality, uh, then it's just anything and everything. Cannot give in yeah, to anything, not anything. to the yogurt, not to the tablecloth, nothing. Yeah. I mean, Please. afterwards, suppose you lost the game. Uh, there are just players who spent years afterwards arguing that you know, had they stood firm on the yogurt, you know, they would have... Yeah, what can I say?
how do you prepare for a match? Is there a tension in the pit of your stomach? Um, when I go to the board, uh, then you can really feel it. Also, just before I'm going to the game. It's what really happens? bad. Um, I don't know. I'd, I'd rather not go most of the time. Really? <laughs> My wife sometimes says I, I look very enthusiastic when I go before a game. And sometimes not so much, but I don't see how she can make out. I'm always a little bit edgy before a game. Um, and then once the first few moves come out, then it's pretty much gone. Do, do players talk to each other during a match? Oh, during a game, no. You're not supposed to. Not supposed to talk at all? No. But you can glare? Um, yes, you can do all that stuff. Kasparov was like an angry bear. I remember at the World Trade Center, I think it was in the 11th game. Mm -hmm. Did it put you off? Um, a little bit, but uh, what he was doing was getting up after every move uh, and then slamming the door loudly and then walking into his room. Um, you had a private, both players mm -hmm. had private waiting rooms. And, um, and then he'd come and slam the door again, get, go to his board and so on. Um, it was really, really annoying. But um, at a certain point, I, I found that it's something I should have uh, dealt with in, in some way. Yeah. Because what he was basically saying is, okay, I'm, I'm not going to, all the decency is gone. I think I'm just going to try and win any way I can. No holds barred. Yeah. Well, let's say this is something, an action of his that I did not respect, <laughs> to put it mildly. Mm -hmm. But I want to ask you, Vishen, I've been waiting to ask you, how can you possibly play 10 games blindfolded without ever seeing a board? Well, um, it's tough, but um, I don't know, I've got the hang of it now. But, but after uh, 10 moves, 12, 15 moves, then how can you remember who number 3 table was on this and number 8 table was on this? It's not possible. Mm, no, you, you remember the rough position. I mean, you remember, uh, let's say, which opening it started with, and that way you can reconstruct it very easily. I think it's <laughs> unbelievable. But does your memory <coughs> extend to phone numbers, car numbers, faces, names? Uh, very erratically. I'm very bad at car numbers. I'm very good at phone numbers. Uh, I'm good with uh, faces. Very bad with names. Uh, See, so you know, always you always meet people. Do you remember me? Uh, yes, I. But I don't know your name. <laughs> <laughs> okay, usually I lie about that anyway. So yes, yes I, do. I remember your name. Not right now. <laughs> Tell me, do you do you ever bring your own? philosophy, your cultural philosophy, your Hindu philosophy into the game, into the way you play? Probably yes, but uh, okay, during a game at some point, I, it's good to be fatalistic because it helps you to play even better. I don't know if it's, some, is, if it's a mask, or, because obviously if, it, if I lose, it still hurts. It but, does hurt. Uh, it does hurt, but I think the way you play is very much influenced by how, who you are. Kasparov had a sign in his room which read, if not you, than who else? <laughs> mm. <laughs> you should have written something underneath <laughs> it. What would you have written? Uh, Me. Ha ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ah. Great to see you. Thank Come you. and join us. Thank you. I mean, I'm really delighted to have you over here. Pleasure. Are you a chess player as well? No. Well, well she is now. <laughs> she's become one. She started mm. to play against uh, my computer a lot. <laughs> have you had any training from the master? No, I don't have training. He usually mates me in eight moves. <laughs> but now it's getting better. Now it's ten moves. <laughs> okay. You've been married now almost two years. Yeah, two right? years. Was this, uh, it was arranged by your family, so? It was a completely arranged marriage by Anand's family and my family. So, so your parents told you we found a boy for you? Basically, they, we were talking when they would like me to get married and uh, Basically, they said it would take time to find the right boss. I said, okay, you can look, but I would like to work for some time. And my parents were very open to the idea. Then they started searching. The first boy they saw was Anand, and uh, before they knew it, we were engaged. <laughs> we had about a six-month engagement period, and we, we went out quite a lot. You both fell in love during that period. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when they told you that uh, we found Vishwanath and Anand for you, how did you feel? Well, my first reaction was, I don't play chess, now what will I do? But when I spoke to Anand, he says, you know, it's better you don't know chess. Yeah. <laughs> you know, two chess players in a house could be a bit too difficult. And uh, so I started reading more interviews of Anand and things like that, because, you know, the press had lots to say about Anand, and you know, some of it was not completely true. Like, they portrayed him as a serious man, you know, who makes millions moves per second. 
But Anand was just completely different. He was very humorous, witty, and basically what I really liked about him, he was like this boy next door kind of thing. And that's what mm. I really liked about him. He had no airs at all. Mm. I think that's the thing that really <laughs> attracted me towards him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what about you? What attracted you? Uh, basically, the one thing I can really point out is that uh, she was very, very cheerful. Uh, always yeah. very happy, and uh, well, you can see. <laughs> 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 always uh, laughing. Just very happy person to be around. Mm. That's what I like most. You've said that your chess improved after your marriage. Yes, um, I think the major factor is that I'm just very happy. Uh, it's nice to be around her, uh, and um, I guess I'm just happy. That, um, that probably shows <laughs> in the chess. Tell me which areas of his life have you taken charge of? I don't think there's anything specific as such, but like, for instance, if it's a tournament or a match, there are certain things that, you know, which have to work according to schedule, like his diet or the clothes he needs to wear, like phone calls coming in, these mm. are the things I clearly take over. Actually, it was quite funny. When Anand played in Lausanne, uh, I strictly told the reception, no phone calls, because, you know, the press was calling, there were people calling. And since we had such a short time to start for the match, I didn't want Anand to start, you know, taking phone calls. So every time there was a phone call, they had to speak to me, and if I said, okay, they would connect. So one day after the game was over, Anand was downstairs in the reception, and he wanted to go out for dinner. So he went to the reception and said, connect me to this room. And they said, no, Mrs. Anand says, no phone calls. <laughs> She said, no, sorry, no phone calls. So I said, oh, okay, sorry. And then I hung up. And then I said, wait a minute, I live in that room. <laughs> and then I dialed again. Said, no, no, wait, I actually live there. <laughs> so. And then I got a call saying, there's some Mr. Anand who says he's your husband. Do we connect him or not? When he's playing a crucial tournament, do you go through tension? I think in Groningen we were more tense than Lausanne because it was a knockout elimination. It meant that any day Arun could, you know, have to pack up and leave. And uh, yeah. it was quite sad that in the first round itself, many of the top players, you know, Just, were eliminated. Mm. Arun was the only top player who was mm. playing. And uh, it was quite funny there also. We were in this hotel. And because it's a small town and, you know, most chess players are taken over all the hotels in the town. They were having a problem with rooms because Christmas and New Year was coming. So every morning they would come and ask us when we went down for breakfast, Good day, Mr. and Mrs. Anand. So when are you leaving? Oh. <laughs> and you know, like, first few days we took it well and I would smile. And it so happened Anand had to play a tie-break match against Kalifman. And Kalifman is a very tough opponent. And that day when I went in for a show, I found no towels. So I asked the reception, can you send me some towels? And the roommate said, no. I was told that by today evening you're surely vacating your room. And I was so angry. I said, I asked for a towel. You know, what has that got to do with us leaving? No, 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 you're leaving today. Just and terrible. then I went down and I was like all worked up. And I said, you better write it down. We're leaving on the 31st of December and not sooner than that. And tomorrow morning you ask me this question, we'll not have this table in order. And you know, God willingly, we left on the 31st of December in a very oh nice God. way. <laughs> That's nice. Especially in an elimination tournament. Yeah. Okay, not necessarily uh, superstitious, but even so, I think being asked by someone, "Are you being eliminated today?" <laughs> is terrible. <laughs> not a very nice question. <laughs> so, do, do you commu communicate at all during a game? No, no. not at all. But not at all. No looks, even. Sometimes he gives me the looks, <laughs> like, like when Anand is winning the game. Usually, I don't sit exactly where he's playing. Mm. I sit in the press center and watch. But okay, sometimes when he's winning, you come inside. 
and then he's searching for you in the audience and mm. he's smiling and I'm like look there not here you're not supposed <laughs> to be smiling already and he's like smiling and you know he starts making all the faces and I'm, I start getting jittery again <laughs> okay <laughs> but always like he, when he loses I always keep telling him you know tomorrow there's another game and you have to play that mm. and the funny part is when he wins I said the same thing <laughs> tomorrow there's another game you have to go and play that <laughs> Do you, are you superstitious? Uh, in some ways, yes. In some ways, no. How are you superstitious? <laughs> um, I like to use the same pen <laughs> twice, or um, or eat breakfast. I mean, if I eat breakfast in the, in the first round and then I will lose that day, I'll probably skip breakfast for a couple of days. Silly things. On the other hand, other things. Uh, you know, if I don't get up during a game and I win it, then I'll probably sit on the table the whole time. And, uh, <laughs> otherwise, I, I go for a walk very often. For instance, Karpov, kind of I think he's the most superstitious because <laughs> if he wins with a particular shirt, he doesn't change the shirt for the whole tournament. Well, like, the problem with him is that uh, for many years, he, he used to lose maybe two games a year. So, uh, <laughs> a lot of his photos look the same <laughs> not because they were taken on the same day. <laughs> so tell me, uh, off the chessboard, what, what kind of a person is Vishy? He likes going out and he likes shopping and that's very good. He likes shopping? <laughs> With me. <laughs> what, what, what do you like shopping for? Uh, nothing special. I mean, I, I don't uh, really enjoy shopping by myself that much. Mm. She goes and somehow it's fun to watch her and see what she's doing. So, <laughs> so then it's much more fun. Also you have some company and this is nice. Mm. Vishy, not all the cricket players, Sachin, Saurav, Azhar and the entire team put together earned as much as you did in 1997. Apparently you earned about six crores. And so far, <laughs> they say your earnings are about 25 crores. What does money mean to you? Uh, where's the rest of the money? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I it's because a bit, uh, bit on the high side. Just a bit? Quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the crickets do fine, but... Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, to some degree, it's all it's a security. Um, I mean, most sportsmen um, have to think about the time, and you know they can't uh, pursue their sport anymore, especially to play at the highest level. It mm. really has to be something you enjoy, and mm. you, you know, you give your all and that kind of thing. Okay, obviously it helps um, that I don't have to think about uh, the financial aspect for a while. But um, my my tastes are not very extravagant, let's say. I mean, mm. I don't necessarily, I don't need to blow a huge amount to have a lot of fun. I can mm. have a lot of fun in very simple ways. And uh, that's quite handy if you want to say around. <laughs> what response do you get from your fans in India? You get the whole range of uh, responses. I mean, I've received um, letters and emails and so on, you know, before, uh, before and after my match mm. and Lausanne and so on. But I've also met people who come to my house and, and you know, they're telling me how uh, during New York, for instance, that uh, they sat and prayed after the 10th yeah. game, 11th game. And uh, for me, it's funny because uh, even I don't, uh, I, I, even I wasn't as upset by certain things as they were, or yeah. even I wasn't as happy with the certain result as they were. And, uh, I'm really amazed by how many people really get in, who know how much what like you do means to so many others. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, no, that, that would be, that's a d very big part of the enjoyment mm. I get out of playing chess. That also, it means something to other people. I know everybody is rooting for you all over the world. Yeah, in Lausanne also, the people were very supportive. Like every time you would enter the the hall, there'd be about five hundred people just clapping. You know, mm. non-stop clapping. And the moment Kapo would enter, they would all just sit down and you know, not, there was just pin drop silence. Mm. And every time I would go out for a cup of coffee, they would say, "Come on, Anand, you can do yeah. it." You know, and that was very, very special. <laughs> That's true. You know, I really don't know what to wish you. All I can say is that I hope your king will be invincible and your queen will always be beside you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for this rendezvous. Thank you.